All right, thanks, Justin. <clears throat> Everyone, it's great to you're all joining us. I apologize. I am fighting a cold, so <clears throat> if my voice cracks from time to time. I'll get my apologies on that, but we'll still try to have some fun, share some interesting uh, thoughts here. So I thought I'd just kick it off because people always say like hybrid intelligence, aren't you the artificial intelligence guy? Well, we're not really moving so much towards, I'll say artificial intelligence future, but hybrid intelligence future. Ironically, you know, my mom, she's always saying like, you're working on artificial intelligence. Why don't you work on real intelligence? Because, you know, it always seems like the biggest challenges are people. Well, that's what hybrid intelligence actually is, is complementing our human capabilities with machine abilities so that it's not human versus machine, it's human and machine finding synergy to actually do more work together. And I'll explain into a much deeper level what I mean by that. But let's kind of set the stage first. <clears throat> so going, going back in time in my IBM Watson days, there was a lady in Japan that she fell ill, went and saw her doctor of like 20 something years, you know, tried a few things, ran some tests, couldn't figure it out, started seeing some specialists, they were running tests. Long story short, after seven months, they were kind of stuck. And someone said, hey, let's reach out to the IBM Watson guys, see if they can help us. So got the call, because of course we'll try and help. So Watson looked at all the great work the doctors and nurses had done, all their studies, her family medical history, her genomics, you know, asked the patient a few questions. And basically came back and says, okay, she has these two rare forms of leukemia. And, you know, people just kind of threw their arms up in the air and said, oh my God, there's no way that's possible. We're like, okay, we get that. Maybe Watson made a mistake, but could we, could we test for it? So they tested, and she tested positive for both forms of leukemia. And now that they knew it was wrong, they were able to put her on the, a proper treatment plan to help her spur recovery. Then everyone started asking the question was like, well, how on earth could Watson have figured that out when all these great human doctors couldn't? Well, it's not that Watson is about better than those human doctors. It just has this big advantage. Two, really. One, it had read over 20 million medical studies. So the average doctor actually has less than five hours a month to keep up on the latest clinical research, pharmaceutical trial studies, medical journal articles. How do you stay on top of things? <laughs> and no human doctor has the time to read 20 million medical studies, period. So the fact that Watson is actually able to do that, has all the information, is an advantage. The second thing is, is Watson doesn't have this kind of bias in that just because we've never seen it before means it can never happen. And we had never really seen these two formal leukemia showed up like this. So the thinking was that that's not really a possibility. And because we don't consider that, we never look for it. We never test for it. But this is also a good example of what I mean by hybrid intelligence. It's not that somehow Watson outdid the doctors and nurses. It supplemented their own knowledge, right? But the fact they could read all these studies and synthesize that information to help the doctors do a better job, that's really the key thing. And this, this happened about, well, uh, almost eight years ago now. Since then, we've kind of stepped up our, our game, just generally speaking, with AI, particularly in healthcare. So to show you kind of what I, I think is more than just automation, but really innovation, I'm gonna play you a, a short video. There's not much audio, so don't worry about that, but just watch what this gentleman is doing. You probably notice that somehow he's controlling that robotic arm with his mind. And in a sense, he kind of is. This isn't Elon Musk's Neuralink. I assure you, we did not drill a hole into his head. 
and put a chip in there and try to code his brain waves. That actually won't work because, well, we don't understand the brain well enough to teach an AI system. What we do know though, is if you're born without a limb or you lose it in an accident, the brain still has signals, it still sends signals to the stuff. So smart engineer, first thought is, okay, I got to figure out what the brain's trying to signal to code that, to decode the brain. Now that's not really going to work because we can understand the brain. But again, working with doctors and clinical researchers, what they actually helped us understand was when the brain sends that signal to the stump, it actually triggers a process in the body. And part of that process is muscle and tendon motion in the arm. So if you look above his right elbow, you see this black band. That's actually an IoT sensor array. And it's designed to pick up those slight minutia of motion. And that we can train an AI system on. So that gets captured, translated, and then put into the robotic arm. So you saw he's able to raise it up, make a fist, he can do high five, shake hands, grab a cup of coffee. So this has been a research project that's been going on for a couple of years, but we've been able to restore some level of mobility, not full, but some level of mobility to people that have lost a hand. Now we're working on uh, you know, something for the foot and the leg. So it's the power of the technology that we have, but it's also the power of the domain expertise coupled with the technological experience. But it's also, again, augmenting our own human capabilities with machine capabilities. And that's what hybrid intelligence is all about. There are lots of things that people are actually better at than machines are. We have not figured out how to teach creativity or imagination, instinct, flexibility. These are all strengths that we have as people. Whereas machines, well, they can crunch lots and lots of data. They can do it quickly, it's scalable, it's consistent, it's cheap. So this is why I say it's not human versus machine, it's human and machine. It's coupling our strengths together to create this extra value. And that's where I really see us moving is towards hybrid intelligence. So H&R Block has actually been using AI for the past almost nine years now to do tax returns. It can't do all 100% tax returns, but it can use, do about 80, 85% of them because it's fairly standardized. So it will prepare the returns. It knows all the tax laws, which honestly no human actually knows. And I've asked tax attorneys that. But because of that, when it prepares a tax return, it knows all those exemptions and credits and stuff. It's actually been able to increase the average return by about $237. So it prepares everything, and then it's given to a human accountant to actually review. So the human will, will spend maybe about 30 minutes just looking, does everything seem all right? They're like, whoa, I didn't know this credit existed. Let me just quickly double check that. Yeah, it does. And that's how it does the bulk of the work. Now the human accountants, they're working on another 10, 15% that are super complicated. It might be multi-state, multi-international, bunch of trusts, pass-through corporations, whatever it might be. But again, it's a good example of how we're augmenting our human capabilities and machine capabilities and also freed up our time to work on more complicated tasks and focus on more high value added work. So to give you another example of this, I'm gonna play another video here. And I, people tend to find this one fascinating because we think about machines having some restrictions and they do, but sometimes they're not restricting the way we think we are. But, Back in the day, I was approached by Fox Studios, get my Watson days. But they said, look, hey, we have this movie coming out. It's uh, about an AI. It's like a horror movie. Can we do something with you? I'm <laughs> like, um, I'm not so sure I want to do a horror movie about AI, not, not our game over here. Like, no, 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 we're not trying to say that, you know, Watson's going to eradicate humanity. So I said, okay. Well, what if we had Watson watch the movie and create a trailer for you? I'm like, wait, wait, what? You can do that? Yeah. 
So I'm going to play the video on how we actually... <coughs> so I, I will tell you guys, if you haven't seen the movie, it honestly isn't that good. So I, I can't really recommend it. It's probably worth watching once. My apologies to Fox Studios. But um, they had a specific target audience in mind. And so this trailer that Watson created was geared towards that demographic. And they did outperform by almost a factor of three with that group. But what people found surprising was that watching the movie wasn't just like, okay, natural language processing, okay, looking at your computer vision, some of these other things. It was actually looking at like the emotional tenor of the scene. It was looking at themes and characters and plot elements, trying to figure out for that particular demographic, what snippets would make the most sense and in what order. And of course, you have the people to help put the music, some of the, the, the wipes, the editing together to actually do that. So a good example of hybrid intelligence. Now, my former colleague asked a great question there. Is it possible that one day machines could create? Well, I have a buddy, Ross Goodwin, that kind of went just down that path to explore and said, could I create an AI that could write an original film script? So he uh, created an AI named Benjamin and actually did write an original film script called Sunspring. Uh, it's a short film. It was actually made by the, I think it was it uh, Thomas Heidelson from, or sorry, Thomas Middleton from Silicon Valley. I think it's still on YouTube if you ever want to check it out. It's, it's in some regards a little bit nonsensical, but in some regards just really it's kind of archy type of film. And it actually won several awards. So a lot of people said, like, well, how in the world did it do that, right? Did you give it like millions of movie scripts? Did it watch all these movies? Is it just kind of rehashing different pieces? No, it was actually an original film script. What Ross ultimately figured out was every movie ever made actually fits into one of 12 archetypes. So if you want to teach an AI system, well, how to write a film script, you teach the 12 archetypes, you teach a little thing about characters and dialogue, and now it has the ability to actually write a film script. And that started paving the way for this whole kind of AI and art wave, where now we have people like LJ Rich and Reaps One creating AI systems that are writing lyrics and original music. You guys are probably familiar with Dali from OpenAI that it can create digital graphics for you and even tweak it. A lot of people are now using that to create specialized images for their logos, their podcasts, you know, Twitter posts, whatever it might be. So it's still taking the human creativity, the human direction, but it's augmenting the ability to actually bring that into well, digital art through Dolly's AI capabilities. And that's, I think, the big transformation we're really going through. Now, we always like historically talked about from a marketing standpoint, demographics. Okay, where does this person live? How much household income, age, gender, that kind of stuff. And in the kind of the early days of current AI wave, started getting into sentiment analysis, but we realized that's also a bit backwards looking. We started getting into psychographics, so using natural language processing and other things to use clues to decipher like personality traits, opinions, interests, hobbies. That's morphed into even the use of neurolinguistics. So this is a real company, it's their founders, they let me use this, but they realized that language is a fingerprint. It's very hard to disguise. So <clears throat> this is from their Zoom plugin, but you can see whatever they were talking about, when they were talking, but just from that one conversation, their AI is able to decipher, okay, how do they learn? What's their level of commitment to whatever they're talking about? What are the things they're focusing on? How do you communicate with them? How do you work with them? Even can even recommend what words to use to better connect with them. So in effect, they've created a very powerful AI communication coach. So through the use of psychographics and neurolinguistics, we actually now know how to engage each person by speaking their language, using their preferred channel, and offering the right incentives so we can maximize engagement each time, every time. 
So it's a powerful tool for marketers, but it's a powerful tool for communication in general. I don't know about you, but my better half, love of my life, we've been together a long time, but she and I still have miscommunications, misunderstandings from time to time, right? I would love to have this little AI assistant over there. Sometimes they're like, you know, she's saying something and, you know, I'll try and respond back with, uh, you know, a fact or a detail and be like, nope, 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 that's not going to connect with her. That's not what she's looking for. She's just looking for some emotional validation. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a good example of hybrid intelligence and probably save a lot of our relationships. But it has uses elsewhere as we've actually started rolling out this technology to help people with mental health issues. So at least before the COVID pandemic, the biggest illness in the world was actually loneliness. But 40% of people suffered from moderate to severe loneliness. And it's, it's tough to sometimes even ask for help. And so by using this technology, you could create a safe space, not a replacement for human relationships, but a safe space where if a people, someone needed to connect or to have, have a sympathetic ear, they would get that. And the AI, you know, would use words, other things that resonated with them. And can also assess and say, hey, is this person going neurotic? Are, are they going to have an episode? Are they going to be suicidal? And alert a therapist or alert 911 so they can actually get immediate help. This has also been now taken into the world of domestic violence and date rape, where unfortunately a lot of victims don't realize what's actually happened. And sometimes their first reaction is think somehow they did something to trigger that. They have chatbots like Rainbow AI using this technology to again create that safe space, ask questions. It's using language they connect with so they understand what actually happened and were they actually assaulted. So I know that's a deep kind of example, but we're seeing the same type of thing now where <clears throat> like fraud detection and financial services, ironically, I had an incident about uh, two months ago where you know, we were leaving the restaurant. <laughs> we had gotten really great service, so I left a nice tip. As we're literally walking out of the door of the restaurant, I get a text message from my credit card and said, hey, we noticed that you left this amount as a tip. This is like 8% higher than you normally tip. Did you mean to do this? And I was like, whoa, that's pretty speedy. It must be using AI to monitor that kind of, that kind of tip behavior. Right, it's actually tracking. So I, you know, I said, yes, I did. I did, it was great service. But a good example of, again, where hybrid intelligence comes into play. Same thing with CSRs. You talk about call centers, a lot of them now use little AI supervisors. So as they're on the call, the AI is also listening in, might be looking up information to help the CSR. So it doesn't have to, the CSR does not ask any questions, might detect the person starting to get frustrated or angry alert the person and make suggestions about using more smooth, smoothing comments. <clears throat> and, you know, we'll give them feedback if you're doing a good job, a smiley face, a frowny face, if you're not doing a good job. But it's, it's immediate real-time feedback for them. Something that no human supervisor could actually do, at least not on one to many basis. So <clears throat> a lot of great things here. And we've seen just kind of the, the, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this AI wave and how we can actually use it, but we actually have a rather large challenge in front of us. And that's really the future of, of work. So I get lots of people ask me, look, I get this and I get you're talking about hybrid intelligence, <coughs> but what are the jobs, right? I need the jobs to know what the skill sets are so I can properly train people. So if you're telling me that we're gonna be farmer, like someone that's developing precision pharmaceuticals and they're gonna be using hybrid intelligence. I need to know what that role is, the activities, the tasks, responsibilities. So I get to find the skill sets to come up with, you know, training program, curriculum, whatever. Well, I will tell you here, farmer, space miner, drone manager, space junk recycler, these specific jobs really don't matter. We know the future of work is hybrid intelligence and the future of work with hybrid intelligence is actually rooted in five skill sets. 
every job will need these five skill sets. They are problem solving. Fortunately, we don't do a good job or sometimes no job of teaching people how to think critically. But the future of work is going to rely on that kind of capability. Second are the soft skills. I prefer the term essential skills. Most people call it soft skills, but it's the communication, the collaboration, negotiation, the teamwork, the empathy, because, well, more and more of our work is being done as projects, sometimes different people. And it's more about collaboration, constructive conflict that yield the innovative ideas. Third skill is creativity. Unfortunately, something else we don't do a good job of is teaching people how to be imaginative, how to be good creative thinkers. It surprises a lot of people when they find out that a lot of the big companies today prefer hiring MFAs, Master of Fine Arts, over MBAs, Masters of Business Administration, because they just feel like MBAs learn frameworks, steps, and equations. It's pretty rigid. They can't think outside the box. But MFAs, because well, you're creating art, must have some level of imagination. You can extend beyond the box. That's why they prefer MFAs. Fourth skill is technology capabilities. You don't need to be a machine learning programmer. You don't need to be a roboticist. You don't need to know R or Python. But you have to understand the foundational capabilities of these technologies to understand how they can actually be applied. In other words, you don't have to know how the hammer is actually built, but you have to know how to be able to use the hammer. And last is subject matter expertise. Basically, you have to have a domain, healthcare, finance, marketing, retail, whatever it is that you can apply these four skill sets to, to address problems and, you know, exploit opportunities. So every job, the future of the work is going to rely on these five skill sets. Now you're probably thinking, okay, that makes sense. But you also said we don't really teach problem solving and creativity. Subject matter expertise, I get. We're already doing that. Technological capabilities, we can learn about that. Soft skills, same thing. But what about the thinking aspects? That's the real rub that we have. The honest truth is, it's hard for us to develop our brain unless we feel the pain. So we can't learn without pain, as Aristotle said. So like I live in California, I'm not trying to be political, but you know, a lot of people in California believe that there's climate change going on. And I think these last numbers I saw, 97% of the population says climate change is a real thing. Yet, even in California, people do things that are not very climate friendly. And the reason is usually they don't understand the impact of their actions and behaviors because they don't feel the pain. Well, that's actually a big problem. We're, we're not going to be able to tackle some of these great challenges or even some of the small problems unless we were able to actually experience them. That's just unfortunately the way we are wired as human beings. And that's not really a good approach. So we luckily have an alternative. So for the last couple of years, I've been looking at the intersection, essentially the combination of the metaverse, AI, and cognitive science to tackle this and to create the opportunities to make people into better problem solvers and better creative thinkers. Solve the problem with those two weak skill sets. So your first reaction is probably why metaverse? Metaverse is just a digital world. It could be on your screen. It could be VR, AR, XR. The power of the metaverse is that it gives us the freedom to experiment, to take risks we normally would not take. I liken it to the Doctor Strange movies where they go into the mirror dimension to practice magic. It looks just like a replica of the real world, but if I accidentally blow up a building, it doesn't impact anything in the real world. I can accelerate things so I can see how things actually happen over time. 
without having to wait for actual time to pass. And so because of that, I'm willing to try more risky solutions and see what happens. And that's what we've seen with people that have actually done this. Fortune 500 C-suites and boards, nonprofits, all these things. I'll share a few examples with you guys. They all become huge risk takers inside the metaverse. So it's this grand chance to experiment. It's also this grand chance to leverage digital twins. So we can actually replicate the real world and how things would function in the metaverse. You've already got companies like Maria that are taking like their propulsion systems and create digital twins of it. So people can actually experiment, they can play around with some design, your fabrication, and try it out in a metaverse simulation. So very cheap, very quick to do. It explodes, no harm done. But it, if it works, it leads to faster and better disruption. That's what they found. Even something as old as agriculture. We've been creating digital twins of farms since 2016. So we can actually analyze the terrain, the topography, the topsoil, climate conditions, factor in actually using AI, factor in insect infestation, the price of crops, figure out the, you know, and then experiment. What's the right balance of cash crops versus nutrition crops? What's the rotation cycle should be? What kind of seeds should I even be using? And we've seen that because of this, farmers now have been able to improve crop yields by about 30% using 10% less topsoil and about 20% less water. One thing I found incredibly surprising is law. Many lawyers, forget even law students, but many like lawyers, associate lawyers, and even some partners, have actually never even been inside a courtroom. And it shows when they actually have to go in the first time. We can solve this problem with the metaverse by actually creating a virtual courtroom to actually enable training. Outside of the big mega firms, not many law firms can actually afford to do that. I mean, imagine you go to a doctor and the doctor's actually never been inside the hospital before. Well, that's actually what happens with lawyers. But again, it gives them a chance to practice, to experiment, right? Get feedback on their performance. We're doing this for people with mental health issues that suffer from anxiety or people that want to practice going to a job interview. We're working with some law enforcement agencies to practice, you know, intense situations. So create that realism, the same kind of effect. So they, they actually see it and they actually develop those skills as more reactionary than maybe they freeze up or they get anxious or, you know, make some, some other mistake. So that's the power of the metaverse, experimentation and more risk-taking. Where AI comes into play, well, it has lots of big data. So it can crunch through lots of things. It can put millions upon millions of variables into the scenario. It can mix it up. It can, it's never the same way twice. So you can't memorize your way through. As you learn and improve, it makes it more complex. So you can keep growing. So that scenario planning becomes really important. And then one thing I've seen is that AI is really good about black swan events. Things that we think that, well, could never happen are actually more likely to happen than we realize, much like the woman in Japan with the two rare forms of leukemia. <clears throat> so that's actually helped better prepare some of these people that suddenly they're confronted with something they've never seen before. Again, they're in the metaverse, they can try that, but suddenly seeing this and seeing the interlocking of how this thing actually came to be makes it more real for them. Makes them realize, ah, this is not a rarity, it's not a black swan event after all. And lastly, AI, because of all the scenario play and the big data stuff is really good about showing us the ripple effects. As humans, really good about, this is what I'm trying to do and this is direct impact. We don't think about the ancillary impacts that may occur. AI is really good about that. It can show us what else will happen from our actions, our decisions. And then the cognitive science element comes into play because, well, we have to try and figure out the, the right kind of structure. How do we help people become better creative and critical thinkers? How do we improve their cognitive abilities? How do we engage them? What's the right type of gamification, rewards, incentives to do that? And what are the right performance measurements to look at so they're actually making progress 
I mean, the AI knows how to make the scenario even more complex, that can keep actually getting better. So that's what we're actually seeing. And so today you got a lot of organizations using this combination of the metaverse, AI, cognitive science to tackle large problems, to do training like a virtual courtroom, or even help your doctor prepare for surgery that they may have not have done for the last five years. To quickly rebuild those skills or quickly build those skills in the first place, measure their performance in real time, adjust, give coaching, advise, advising, all these things. And the ultimate outcome from all this that we've seen is it actually triggers this flow state in people much, much faster. This is where we can actually teach people creativity, critical thinking, but also teaches them focus, productivity, improves overall performance. Now, one of my good buddies is Stephen Kotler. He's always big about the state of flow and neuroscience. And that's what he tries to coach people in doing. He does a whole institute set up in hard science that you want to be good at problem solving. You want to be good at finding that disruptive solution. You have to be able to get kind of into this zone. And it's hard for us to do that. But ironically, this combination of the metaverse, AI, cognitive science actually teaches us how to enter that flow state. So like the executives we've worked with, they've gone through, they've tackled their problems, but it's carried forward in their cognitive abilities that in the real world, a scenario they hadn't even anticipated, hadn't been trained for like in the metaverse occurs, their ability to react to it is much faster. Their ability to get into that flow state is much faster. Their ability to think more creatively about it much faster. Their ability to anticipate more indirect impacts much larger. So that's become the power of this combination of technologies. And this is where I think we're, we're all moving towards is what we call convergence, the combination of emerging technologies. We always say that AI is unlocking you know, exponent, exponential potential. Blockchain is unleashing exponential value. Well, convergence is unleashing exponential to the exponential value for us. It's just, we don't think about connecting the pieces together like that. And this all comes back down to, to hybrid intelligence. So while we're augmenting our own capabilities and machine capabilities, we're actually also using this now to improve our creativity, our flexibility, our ability to have the right skill sets for the future of work so that we can actually even become better at what we're already strong at. So it's another tool set. Hybrid intelligence actually plays a dual role for us, not just in the work we're trying to perform, but actually improving our own sort of bag of skills and knowledge to do future work. So I know I hit you with a lot of stuff. I'll let some of that sink in. I'm sure people have questions. We'll get to that in a second. But I do want to share a bit of advice because I know that some people start thinking about this, they get excited or they see some demo work, or they you know, other things, and they, and their mind goes, like, goes a million miles, like, we're okay, we're gonna go and we're gonna teach every everybody in the world how to be a disruptive thinker. Or we're gonna go out and we're gonna make everybody a uh, you know, top-notch doctor. Or we're gonna go out and make every employee an, an innovator, entrepreneurial thinker. That's tough. Right? I'm not saying it's impossible, it's tough. It would take a lot of time and resources. We know, especially with AI and these data, but I always stress the importance of taking smaller steps. Think about some low-hanging fruit, something small, first to start with. See how it works, get some value, build some momentum. Because the truth is, a lot of people I've talked to about this, they don't, they, their first reaction is it can't be true. You can't be that combining these things work or that even AI can do some of these things. Like, well, AI is not good at reading the emotions of a person. It's a machine. It doesn't understand feelings. Although that's actually not true. We've actually, it's been benchmarked that AI is better at reading the emotional state of a person than other human being is. Because you can look at our body language, our tone of voice, our word choice as a laser focus on it. So we got to be cognizant of that. Take small steps, show value. That's how you build upon success. Second, pick something with 
a little amount of variance. So don't go something like, well, there's a million different outcomes that could happen here. It's too much, too much time, too much work to fi figure out. <clears throat> you'll, you'll never get off the ground. Pick something with a low amount of variance as your small step. Again, that way you get to it quickly. You can show some level of value. But then third, and I can't state this enough, do not underestimate the value of solid training for your machine learning, for your AI systems. I can tell you for the past decade, it's the one thing I see a lot of people constantly overlook. People are worried about, do we have the data? Do we have this? Is it in good shape? It's important, but AI just doesn't know things on its own. It needs to be trained. It has to understand classes and concepts. So if you don't have the right ground truth, rules on how to make decisions, if you don't have the right subject matter experts to teach the machine, you're not going to go very far, right? We are, unfortunately, as human beings, again, we think sunny day scenario, we think about direct impacts, we have to get good at exception cases, rainy day scenarios, and indirect impacts. So these are my three pieces of advice embarking down this journey. So I always like to leave with a little bit of a, a takeaway because I know you guys are here to, to learn a bit, understand what's going on out there, but I want you to think about something in your life. It could be professional, it could be for your community, it could be for your personally. But like, what's, what's some kind of problem out there or what's some sort of you know, opportunity or really thought, really, have, really what's an opportunity you haven't really tapped into? What could you do? Right? What could you do with AI? What could you do with the combination of AI, the metaverse, and cognitive science to do something? Something small, less variance, good training. So that's my challenge to all of you. I want you to think about what's your big idea. And I would love to hear what it is. It doesn't have to be right now. You can always reach out to me later. But what I've learned is everybody has one, at least one good idea, one needle moving idea that's very achievable. So that's my challenge to all of you. What's your idea? So with that, I will open it up to questions. Well, amazing. That was that was a great presentation, Neil. Um, very uh, just, yeah, like you said, you threw a lot of stuff at us. So very, very enlightening. Uh, I actually posted on the link here um, in the chat the conversation that you and I had uh, in our podcast here uh, a number of weeks ago. So I want people to check that out. Also, Neil has a book out. Um, I have a, a link a link out to that as well. Uh, I highly suggest you um, check that out. And I have a quick question here too. So Neil, you you sort of um, painted this this utopia, right? Um, which which I love it. I, I think that the whole idea of this hybrid intelligence is let's take the best of what humans can do, the best of what machines can do, and let's make the world a better place. How have you seen this being used for bad, I guess, right? Um, like cyber terrorism, like uh, deep fakes, like some of those types of things. Are, are you, are you, I mean, obviously that's going to be a component of it. Um, where's your mind at on that? And how, how have you seen some negative effects of this being done? It's a, it's a good question, Justin. And unfortunately, there are always bad actors out there. But your, your take like on deep fakes is a really good one. You know, I talk about digital twins, my, my presentation, the mirror image side of that is the deep fakes. Digital twins, you have the permission of whoever the person is or whoever owns it, or maybe it's themselves, to make that replica. Deep fakes is that you, they, that person doesn't have permission and they're using it for some malicious intent. So I don't want to go too, too graphic in here. And I'll, I'll really try and curtail myself here, but most people don't realize this whole concept of deep fakes started with a few engineers thinking about like, well, I'm going to make this up. I love the movie John Wick, but I didn't want Keanu Reeves to be the actor. And so they started thinking like, well, what would it be like to have like Matt Damon in it? And they figured out a way to insert Matt Damon into the movie and, you know, have the lines be read or said by Matt Damon and his voice style. It was a cool kind of little thing. So I'm sure they had some fun with it, but then you had one person that said, this is interesting. You don't have to use actors. You could use anybody, and you could put them in anything. 
and that's where deep fake started springing from. We've all heard about the you know the deep fake of President Obama and Nancy Pelosi and all that. <clears throat> what most people don't realize is it's the average person that gets hit the worst by deep fakes. There's actually an app called uh, Deep Porn. And what it was designed to do was, you know, you break up with somebody, you're unhappy, you can take images, photos, audio of them, and it would create a fake porno video with them in it. And then, you know, send that out to whoever. You're the average person, what's your recourse, right? At least if you're President Obama, you're famous, you have people, you can discredit it, but if you're this average person, what do you do? And you don't know who's seen it, you know? can't just go out to the world and say hey this isn't me and what are people going to think yeah yeah right uh-huh that that's that's the problem so all, all these things we talk about there's a good use there's a bad use you know people have said like well maybe we shouldn't be employing this technology until we figure out how to stop the bad use well, the problem is there's no way to do that the bad actors are going to do this whether you like it or not it's like with cybersecurity. You know, we're using AI, for example, to monitor for threats in real time, do uh, intruder detection, even do physical uh, weakness assessments. But at the same time, cyber criminals have been using AI technology for five, six years to find new ways to hack into systems, to do social hack, to do these other things. It's just like a never ending arm race, unfortunately. Yeah, I definitely feel like there's, yeah, basically an arms race, right? It's going to be leveling up on all sorts of different levels uh, with any technology, really, to be honest. Um, anybody anybody want to drop in here, uh, unmute themselves? I, have, I haven't seen anything posted in the chat per se, but if, if anybody, if there's anything that they wanted to ask, that would be great. Hey, I've got a quick question for you, Neil. Thank you, by the way. This was an excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. I'm going to check out your book for sure. So uh, my question is, I've been playing around, and I don't know if I can share my screen or not. It doesn't look like it. But uh, I've been, I'll share some of the photos I've generated or some of the creations the machine has generated. I've been playing around a lot with Dolly, uh, which is uh, Dolly 2, which is OpenAI's image generator. And um, in playing around with it, one of the things I've realized, it's it's actually creative. Uh, you know, that some of the, the solutions that came up with were original and things that I wouldn't have even considered. Like, yeah, it's just amazing. Like some of the, the you know, things that I that I was surprised by. So I guess I'm challenging a little bit this notion that uh, AI can't be creative uh, and maybe it just presses a definition of what we mean by creativity. And, and uh, yeah, is, is, is that a notion that's purely human or can that be something that uh, AI uh, can be? It's an interesting question, Stephen. I, I would say that AI is not capable of original thought. So that, that doesn't mean they can't be creative, but they're not capable of original thought. All AI systems are passive. They only tend to they only respond to queries or triggers to do some function. But it, I think it's interesting. I think that we have seen some creativity. I mean, the paintings, the sculptures, the music, I think there's definitely a sense of some originality in there, but I don't know if we can say it's imaginative. It's it's not like the AI system on its downtime is just kind of thinking to itself, like, hmm, can I come up with some sort of new abstract form of art, you know? Which is why I, I say it's really an original thought or question than anything else. Not creativity. I think we've seen that there is creativity, but original thought, not so much. Not yet, anyway, right? Well, so, <laughs> so that, it's an interesting question, Stephen, because you know there are people. Where, original thought involves what we call AGI, artificial general intelligence. And depending on you talk to, we're five years, ten years, fifty years, never get or never never even reaching it. And I'm I'm not in the mindset that we're moving towards a singularity and all that kind of stuff. I don't think we're actually working that much towards AGI. I think we're, I actually believe in the cyborg future. I, I think we're actually looking at human machine integration, that we're going to augment our own biological capabilities with machine capabilities. So like you saw the robotic hand thing I showed you, you've also got now 
the uh, they've done the surgery, I think, a dozen times where a person that's blind, they can actually install digital cameras under the eyelids and transmit the image to the brain. It, it's fuzzy and, and black and white, but like all technology, it will get better and cheaper over time. So it might be that one day our our descendants will be seeing the world through X-ray vision. I, I don't know, but I feel like that's a more realistic future. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. No, oh. yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, when you have like billions of neurons and and you know trillions of words running through, it feels. If I think I agree with you in some ways, Neil, it it, it feels like um, when you have you know like GPT three writing text, it feels like wow, this thing is actually generating some new content. But at the end of the day, it's got so much data to pull from that obviously there's a lot of different ways it can go and it can feel like it's generating something new, but it's really based upon what it's been trained. Is that kind of what you're saying? Um, I had a quick question too. I mean, you know, you you mentioned about getting into flow, Neil. I, it feels to me like, I, it feels to me like actually it would be very, um, it, we could feel overwhelmed if there's too much AI, AR, VR, all this sort of stuff going on around us. How, how, I guess I would push back a little bit on that. It feels like the future is going to be a lot more chaotic, I guess, with some of these technologies. It probably will be. Um, there, there's, a, there's a famous video back in 1997 where Bill Gates said, within two or three years, pretty much every company will have a presence on the internet. Right? And well, by 2000, he was pretty much right. That's actually what they say about the metaverse today. I mean, the metaverse is really like a 3D internet. It's just that it's really the next incarnation of the internet. And they say we're at that 1997 moment right now. Like PwC has built their own metaverse city. They have their employees using it. They have the client meetings in there. They have some clients that have built offices, other things. Because we're kind of we're getting more of this kind of, we want this immersive, interactive experience. So I, I'm, I'm an old man. I acknowledge that. I'll, I'll never probably be all the way quite in on that. But I, you know, I look at the kids and the younger generations, and I mean, they're, they're all into it. I mean, I, I feel like their, their phones are just glued to their hands. You know, <laughs> everything they do, like I, you know, I've seen it. They, they could be sitting next to each other, but they don't talk to each other. They, they do it through, through Discord. Or they're doing it through, you know, WhatsApp or whatever. Yeah, you know, you, you mentioned about PwC, for example. I mean, do you think there's going to be a world where, at least initially here, only the the companies with the resources and the money are actually going to be able to participate in this? I, th I think that's where we are today, Justin. But I think three years will be different. Uh, I'm already seeing, again, technology gets better and the costs come down. Like so, so some of the metal work, worst work that we did two years ago, it probably would have cost a couple million dollars to do that. Today, the same kind of work is probably a couple hundred thousand dollars. Three years, it, maybe it's twenty thousand dollars. You know? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. Um, yeah, it becomes more and more commoditized. Well, anyone else have uh, questions they'd like to jump in and add? Yeah, I've actually got two different ones, two like completely different paths. So I actually come from a humanities and cultural studies background myself, uh, but I focused on new age technology and media in my studies. And I focused specifically on AI and virtual reality. Uh, I wrote my thesis about two and a half years ago now, but something I focused on with VR chat was how all of these, um, you know, very internet centered communities were number one, creating their own communities that was really giving them new identities that they didn't have outside of that digital world. But this was conversely kind of creating a dangerous identity vacuum because you wound up with these large online communities of people reinforcing all of the same sentiments, but some of these sentiments got to be very hateful. 
And then on top of that, having the tech barrier of needing to be able to understand VR chat and get into it and create a rig and engage with people meant that there was nobody really outside of these communities having interest to even break in and add difference. I don't have a lot of experience with metaverse itself, but do you think that this could be a similar issue we see with all of these companies in the metaverse? And just what are the challenges you foresee around identity in the metaverse and especially commodified identity? Interesting question, Emily. And there's a lot Thank of actually legal, legal implications that are being discussed right now. Um, <clears throat> One, in the metaverse, you don't have to be your true self, right? That can be an issue. Does that mean you don't identify with who you are? You feel like you're somebody else or you're doing that to fit in? But, you know, we were actually having this discussion the other day uh, at the UN that if you're in somebody's metaverse and someone, like, kills your character and, you know, robs whatever virtual stuff you have, is that murder and property theft? Okay, and then who has sovereignty over that? What, what defines you know, the punishment if there is one or if it's a crime? And then what if the person that attacked you looked like this big burly guy, you know, but in truth, in the real world, it's a 12 year old girl. Do you try the person as an adult? Do you try them as a child? <laughs> Is there something else that's going on here? That these are all things that are getting debated right now. And no offense, it's the tech companies are not going to be the ones to figure this out. I, I don't know if you guys have heard heard of this yet. And again, I apologize if I'm talking about a sensitive subject, but it's come out that Facebook Meta, their metaverse is called Horizon, that you could actually be sexually assaulted in their metaverse. And it's happened. There was actually a reporter that went in, she went to some virtual party, and she essentially got raped, and she was just flabbergasted. And people were like, well, why don't you just like rip the headset off? off? Well, your reaction is fight, flight, or fright. And for her, it was fright. So what does that mean? Are those people responsible? You know, people said, well, there's no actual physical damage, but mentally we know sexual assault actually creates changes and damage to your brain. That, that actually is physical damage. And when Meta was asked about this, like, oh no, there's safeguards built in. Nobody has to do anything they don't want to do. And it's like, well, they may not understand that or someone might tell them the wrong thing or but this is not the first incident that this has happened in the horizon. So there's a whole can of worms on that front that people are trying to figure out. And that's one of the big challenges we always have at the UN is technology moves so fast. And regulators have been historically reactive. They can't even anticipate what may, may occur. And we're at the point now where if you're reacting, it's too late. So on the flip side, just because I told such a powerfully negative story, on the flip side, there's always good uses of things. And one of the things we're actually doing is we're using AI and the metaverse to actually preserve culture and identity. It's actually a big UN initiative. So like the, the Maori, they've seen as the, the you know, <clears throat> people from the, the tribe get older, the young people weren't interested in learning about the, the culture, the history, the language traditions. They didn't have one to pass it on. It wasn't until those, those well, kids reached their 40s, they started getting interested in learning, but the village elders were passing away. And so what they've taken now is you can actually create a digital village elder teach the AI, the culture and the tradition stuff, create you know, a metaverse, it doesn't have to be VR, again, any kind of 3D environment where you can actually learn, try some of these things. And it doesn't have to be just now for the Maori people, it could be anybody that wants to learn about the Maori culture. So there's some good out there. Unfortunately, we don't think more about the good, we tend to think of more about, unfortunately, entertainment or how we can abuse some of the technology. I think you said you had a second question? I do. Um, actually, it will now tie in. Great. I thought there would be two wholly separate questions, but thank you for that insight. Um, that was just really interesting to hear. I 
actually have been a little sad I haven't been able to work with my VR work as I have. So it's really interesting to know that even where I stepped away two and a half years ago is still a relevant question in something where VR and AI age so fast. I didn't know if that would still be a pressing issue. Um, and so my second question, so I actually work with staffing in AI. I am really trying to nurture an AI healthcare network in Minnesota, just for collaborators, innovators, connectors, people to get together with AI healthcare. And you had a lot to say about the changing landscape of careers in hybrid intelligence. And as somebody whose job it is to pay attention to that, I can tell you I'm definitely picking up on a lot of these shifts with candidates and clients as, you know, they talk about projects they're doing or what they're working on. Um, and I, you know, haven't had it put in the words that you did. So I'm curious what you think some of the most pressing issues are right now for current engineers who are working in these AI spaces or working under, you know, data science or a broad title because we're going to move to the hybrid intelligence relatively soon. But those, you know, not everybody might be aware of that or might not understand how to pivot their current AI work into hybrid intelligence. So I'd just love to hear more about it. Yeah, that's that's interesting, especially from, uh, I'll say, an engineering perspective, because we often think of them as the ones making the tools we're using, or the yeah. systems we're using. What, what we're finding, and particularly from an AI side, is we have two we call kind of cliffs. So when the AI does work, the first cliff, cliff is understandability. So sometimes AI comes up with an answer like, whoa, where, where in the world did this come from? And that's used, that understandability cliff is what we call the business cliff. So we don't know how, how it came to that, but the engineers understand. I'm sure they, they got it figured out. Everything's all right. But we're now hitting the second cliff, which is the technical cliff, which we call the interpretability cliff, meaning that the engineers don't know how the AI actually arrived at that conclusion. They don't actually know how the AI thinks. And part of that challenge is because they don't understand the domain that they're really working in. So they, they don't know about things they should be looking at from rules, decision-making, the ground truths, and these other things. That's why when it comes to those five skill sets, I said everyone has to have, engineers have to have a better understanding of the domain they're working in. If they're working in healthcare, they have to have some basic understanding. They have, like, they have to know about like HIPAA compliance, for example. And that's, that's the challenge we're facing. They, the engineers think, okay, the business people are telling me all the stuff I need to know, all the scenarios I need to know. The business people thinking like, well, the engineer's a smart guy. They'll figure out what's one of the right things to put in. And now we created this gap. That's the biggest challenge we're actually facing on the engineering front. Yeah, that's fascinating. Do you think there will be a call in the near future for more humanities backgrounded people like myself to just come in as thinkers and innovators to work alongside engineers? Yeah, and actually I'm, I'm a big proponent. You know, I, know, I know everyone talks about like STEM science, technology, engineering, math, and everyone thinks we need millions of more programmers and data scientists, so we need more, but we actually need more people that study philosophy and the arts, right? You think about the scenario planning, the exception paths, the direct, indirect impacts, those are thought exercises. That's, that's why we need those philosophy skills. And then you think about the experience, you know, we talk about user experience, student experience, patient experience, all these things. How does that craft and shape? What's kind of the vision and image we want to create around that? That's where the arts come in. There's a, probably shouldn't name names, a children's hospital in California that they, they got some big grant money. They bought some uh, really latest high-tech MRI machines to create this environment. We're really going to help a lot of kids that need it. And they start bringing the kids in. The kids in, they would literally walk into these rooms. They would just burst out crying. They would like freak out. They were so scared. Like, what's going on? You know. And I was I was asked to consult and just give some expert advice. And I walk in. I look at the room, and I'm like, well, tell me about the room, right? 
He's like, okay, well, that's the, it's this, no XRJ7 machine with this power and blah, blah, blah. And it's got this, okay. Now, tell me about this room as if I were an eight-year-old child. Uh, well, it's completely white everywhere. There are these loud noises. There's a big, scary machine. And oh my God, that's when they got it. They're like, and so they changed. They actually hired some people, creatives, and they turned all the rooms into themes. Like they turned one of the MRI rooms into like an underwater theme. So the machine looks like a submarine. So it's like you're going in, you don't just hear the, the sound of the machine, you hear the sounds of the ocean and the fish. Another one that's like a jungle adventure. That's where why we need more philosophy in the arts. It's not just we're here to fulfill a function. We're here to think through and create experience. That's awesome to hear. As somebody who is definitely a humanities-minded person, but has deep passion for AI and STEM and innovation, that, that's just rewarding to hear, especially from somebody with recognition like yourself. So thanks so much for answering those questions, Neil, and for such a great talk today. My pleasure. Thank you. That's awesome. That's awesome. So if there's no other questions, I would say, um, you know, Neil, your contact information is on the meetup group. Um, if you wanted to, um, yeah, of course. I mean, if you wanted to put anything here in, in the chat, for sure, let let us know or let uh, feel feel free to do that. Um, if there's no other questions, I think we can we can uh, wrap it up here for tonight. I'll give you one last chance. <laughs> so anyone out there that wants to ask anything. Well, they might be thinking about that. I just dropped my website in there. It's got the contact form, links to all my socials if you want to follow me. All that, all that good stuff, as well as some of the latest trends going on in the industry. That's great. Yeah, and and I I did put a link earlier to your book, which is just one of the sub pages off of that. So yeah, neilsahoda.com. I also dropped in just a quick uh, plug here for our next meeting on January 5th, where we'll be talking about chess engines. How do chess engines work? And we'll look at AI and ML principles for that. But Neil, thank you so much again for um, just the enlightening uh, conversation, just the examples that, that, that you have here. It's just, uh, it's gonna be phenomenal next three to five years in this whole space where, um, you know, like I said, it's this hybrid world, it feels like, you know, where it's, we don't have to have it one way or the other, right? I think machines can do the best thing that they do and humans can do the best thing that they do and we'll be able to get the best of both worlds. So thank you again for presenting to the group and sharing with us uh, all of your, your knowledge. We look forward to keeping in touch with you. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me to be on, Justin. All right. Take care, everyone. We'll plan to see you next month. Thank you, Justin. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, everybody.